I'm Dave Koz, and this is Driving with Dave. Welcome to the Tesla. Ah, so beautiful. So Why candy do doper. The cool cars, Dave. You know, we just we spend a lot of time in our cars here in California. Mm. So it's very important to have one that you enjoy spending time in. <laughs> if you're gonna spend time, I'm gonna give you a little bit more air. So I want to just say, very happy to see you, Dofer. Very happy. To and it's always, when you're talking about California, it's always, do you ever notice like that California is a happier place when you arrive? Uh, no, it's more that I'm happier when I'm in California. You bring a whole level of like just good vibes when you come. When you get off the plane, all of a sudden Southern California is happier because Candy Delphers in, oh, in town. It's because I'm so happy because we escaped the freaking cold and everything here is nice. How bad is it right now in uh, Amsterdam? I don't want to know. Oh, it's like that bad, right? You can't get out un unless you get totally soaked. It's cold. It's windy. It's gray. It's depressing. No matter. It, I'm sorry. As much as you're going to talk bad about your city, <laughs> you can't change the way I feel about Amsterdam. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it has it has some good sides, but the weather is not one of them. No, but when you're there on a nice day. Amsterdam, there's nothing that beats Amsterdam, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Like, you get the tulips, you get... The only thing that I will say about your city is that, um, and if if, uh, if you've been to Amsterdam, you know what I'm talking about. Those are the ninja bicyclists. Yeah. I mean, you can, you <laughs> yeah, have... Be careful. you got to take your own life into... You don't realize that when you're walking across the street that you might be taken out yes, somebody, by a bicyclist. And if you open the car door just and you don't think, you'll kill somebody. And also the trouble is... Uh, you, they are always right by law. So whatever you do, even if they come at you from the left in the dark, run through six stop signs, they, you are still guilty as a car driver. So you have to be really careful. See, but I don't, I don't understand how that's all. Even <laughs> because the, the bicyclist will never be wrong. No, no matter what. Even whatever. if they completely even they land on the top of your car, they are not wrong. So something is wrong. Yeah. Something is wrong about that. <laughs> what was it like growing up in in Amsterdam? I mean, you don't you don't know anything different, but you spent no. so much time in the states. I want to ask a two prong question. Number one, what was it like growing up? I mean, you are the daughter of a very famous saxophonist, so I imagine that was it like absolutely implicit that you were going to be a musician from no. the day you were born, or did you choose it? I think I got to choose it. I think I was there before my father even could entertain the thought that I would be a musician because I was five years old and I asked him, Dad, you have so many those things lying around the saxophones, can I just try one? And I think I surprised him a little bit. I was five years old and I tried the soprano and then I remember playing it and then he was like, oh, wow, you know how to play it. But of course, I'd heard him all my life. <laughs> Every all night. five years. Because he's practicing on the tenor every day, and then he'll play. Da, 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 da. He plays a really loud tenor, and that was my lullaby for you know from the moment I was born <laughs> and brought home till then. So of course I knew how to hold it a little bit, but um, I think one of the things that really struck me, aside from you know making music, is that it's beautiful. It's uh, when I was so young, it was time to spend with my daddy. You know, my father was always in and out because he had a job and he played. So uh, he was the, the most amazing dad, but I could never, you know, pin him down. He was always on the run. So once we started having uh, music as a hobby together, uh, you was know, he I your actual teacher? Him. Like he taught you how to play, or were uh, you mostly self-taught? Actually, self -taught? for one lesson, uh, when I was five, I said, "Dad, can you teach me?" And then he started teaching me. He said, "So that's a G and that's an A," and I would be like, "No, I think that's a B." And then he said, "Okay, this is the <laughs> last first and last lesson we're going to do together." And he sent me to a brass band. Uh, the same thing that he had learned, the uh, same way, and uh, I got there, and uh, yeah, that's actually the only education that I, that I ever. So got. you really didn't have any proper saxophone lessons. You're, you're Can basically you tell? Well, Can you tell? <laughs> no. You're like one of the the. I mean, and I because we spent a lot of time on the road together. I would say that you are one of the most. If, let's just take the funk side 
off the table for a moment and let's just talk about pure consistency of playing your instrument like there's never I've never heard you make a bad note <laughs> I've never heard and the sound uh, is always you. crystal clear and it's beautiful and it's so identifiable and so it's I tried to stay in my consistent. lane that's <laughs> what I do now it's actually it was kind of interesting because when I started we well we had a conservatory but that conservatory was only for you know kids that were 17 or 18 first of all and also they only allowed you to play real straight ahead jazz and at that moment I was young and I was interested in all kinds of you know pop music as well and, and funk and everything and you couldn't play that there so it wasn't that attractive for me and also right around the period that I could choose to go to a place like that my father got into a fight with all the jazz musicians in Holland because he decided after seeing Miles Davis perform with Marcus Miller that he also wanted to play with an electric bass instead of an upright bassist and when he did that, he got thrown out of his own subsidized system that he actually invented for wow. jazz musicians. And we were just because of the bass. Uh huh. Persona non grata. I told the story to Marcus Miller. I said, "Thank you, Marcus. Nobody would ever come to visit our home again <laughs> until much later." And realize realized that, they had... that we were right. So. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it was. It was a big serious thing. acoustic bass summer. enthusiasts. Yeah. Uh huh. So. Uh, but, and that prompted my dad to start playing a lot more with pop musicians, which was great. And for me, it was, a, you know, even more relatable. And I figured, okay, if all these old friends from my dad who always told me that they would teach me jazz aren't going to be like that, I don't need the jazz. So I just started, I don't know how I did it. I just learned the blues in all different scales, and that's basically what I do. But uh, where, when did the, like, your... Um complete appreciation for funk start. I mean, wh wh where was the point, Pretty the early. flash point? Where, but who was it? Who brought that to you? Who brought the music to you? Well, I think, you know, Amsterdam, I was kidding about Amsterdam because of, aside from the weather, if Amsterdam had good weather, everybody wanted to live there. And especially in those days when I was, you know, like 10, 12, like every, all the musicians would come through Amsterdam or stay or hang in Amsterdam. There was so many American musicians playing, plus that my parents had a really, you know, fondness for all kinds of funk music from James Brown, Junior Walker, you know, Soul, mm -hmm. Aretha Franklin, all that stuff. So that was always playing at the house. It was either Sonny Rollins, Miles Davis or Aretha Franklin or the best were people like Willis Jackson or Sonny Rollins that would do, uh, you know, mix the jazz up right. with Soul for, for a little girl. For me, it was, of course, the ultimate. I got, you know, you got the best of both worlds and was more relatable. So. I was just, I don't know, and then you or drowned in that. <laughs> and then you get turned on to Maceo Parker and then everything changes. Yeah, because when I, you know, for me, I, I had heard Sonny Rollins play live when I was five. I had listened to Charlie Parker all my little life. So I always thought that what they were doing in Coltrane was unattainable and also like holy, you know, why, why go there and try to be that? You, I'm never going to be like mm -hmm. that. So. But then when Maceo came with his deceptively simple style, <laughs> which turned out to be even more <laughs> harder to yeah. emulate or to study, um, it was something like, oh yeah, just like Juno Walker, I could really relate. Later at Grover Washington, same thing. You, you, that was something I could at least think I could come close to, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, pretty soon when I was 17 or 18, through totally through by chance, I got to meet Maceo. And I remember the first time he heard, he said, come to my hotel room with a friend. And I was there and he, uh, he's, a, he's a gentleman. Eh? So it was all about music. And they um, doing this concert in the Paradise in Amsterdam. And he said, well, you can join us. And I was like, wow. wow. Yeah. How old were you at the time? 17 or 18. And then, and I knew how to play already. I was playing a lot, but that was, you know, that's different league altogether. So he, I remember him taking my fingers and playing the right, <laughs> putting it in the right place. But I was course totally not offended because it was Maceo right and then from that on we had a friendship I don't know what it's based on of course my love for him and complete adoration but something in me he likes and he's just he's been like a you know like an uncle or a father he, he gets mad when I say that because he still wants to be sexy but <laughs> he's <laughs> like yeah he's, he's family he's just, just like the best and I always when I listen to him it's like nobody will ever you know be close to him because it's even all that stuff about timing that Miles used to say you know like mm -hmm. it's not what you play but where you play it's well, him had, personified but it's he like, had the ultimate gig to when you want to talk about time yes 
playing with James Brown every night. Yeah, crazy. And he wouldn't be he, any better education in terms of that. No, and he has so many stories about that, you know, and and also how he got uh, to play with, you know, James Brown, him and him and his brother, and uh, it's but just I, special. They were also so young when they started, you know, but they just they grabbed it and they did it and they made that sound in the end. They made. How did how did James Brown find Maceo Parker? Was that something that they grew up together? Uh, now Maceo and his brother used to play in the how do you call it the halftime uh, between another band. Oh, they okay. were very very young in a small place from where they were, if I recall cor correctly. And they would just play that little set, you know, really young band. And at first James Brown came through to have a bite to eat and they saw uh, Melvin Parker, Maceo's brother, and he invited him on the road. And then he said to me, said, what do you do? And he said, I play, I play uh, tenor, sir. And he said, uh, next year, if you play alto, you can come and join me. So Maceo wow. went from tenor to alto. And he practiced and he practiced. And next year, lo and behold, James Brown came through that parking lot again. And then they invited him both. And that's he, how it started. He never left the parking lot. He Maybe stayed not. there the entire year, <laughs> waiting on James Brown so. to he come won. back to yeah, get hired. Yeah, he did. I want to tell you though that, that uh, you know the way that I feel about you. I absolutely adore you and I love you and you're like a sister to me. Likewise. Another sister to me. And we've had so many fun times. But just hearing stories about Maceo or like at the rehearsal, we just left Sinbad, the, you know, the great comedian. Yes. You know, he comes, he sees you and he freaks out <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, Candy, Candy. Every, you know, pretty much everybody that I know, that we know together, um, has that same feeling about you. You just bring out this warmth and this sense of fun you're I mean you can play like there's no tomorrow I don't even want to talk about the fact that you're a female because you can play stand you up next to any player of the instrument and go to town and you're right there well, thank but you. you I think what what we all respond to with you is just your humanity <laughs> I, love, sure you do. I love you so much I love you. Mm. See, I dropped you at your hotel. You are so good. I'm coming out to hug you. Thank you, Candy Delphi. Thank Delford. you.